thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we are here with Susan and Art Zuckerman. Apologies for the technical problem on the library side. Um, thank you so much for waiting for the program to start. Um, but I'm just going to hand it over to them to take it away. Um, I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about the Foods of New York, and I hope you are as well. Okay, thank you, Marty. Okay, just a quick background. I'm Art, and this is Susan Zuckerman. Uh, we are licensed tour guides of New York City. Uh, we also have clients, by the way, who are doing Zoom presentations in Hawaii, in Florida, and, and even a foreign country called Massachusetts. <laughs> okay, so we'll have a lot of fun with this thing. We've been doing this for quite a number of years. We have over uh, 80 different presentations that we do, and this is one of our, our favorites because we like food. And New York and New England are wonderful when it comes to eating. So uh, without further ado, let's continue. By the way, we have been hosting a local radio show in New York City on a primetime station, not something out of our garage. And uh, we've been doing that for 15 years now. We've had quite a number of people. We've had a lot of uh, things that so we do, eating tours of New York City. And this is kind of a tie-in. We are licensed, by the way, uh, to teach teachers in New York State. And this, this particular cuisine uh, or this particular um, presentation based on food is, is actually a 30 hour class that we offer teachers for credit. So we're going to condense it down for you guys for 29 hours. Okay. No kidding aside. We'll have a lot of fun with this thing and you'll leave. But without things, we'd like to have you meet one of our clients who we've, we've done a really good job for you. And he'll tell you a little bit about our presentations. And here is one of our clients and we think you'll enjoy uh, him talking about food. nowadays. No consideration for others. Well, that's actually one of our professors who, who teaches a class in etiquette. So we thought you'd enjoy a little bit about that. But let's move on a little bit about some of the things we have. Keep in mind, this is very appropriate for New Englanders and New Yorkers as well, because there's a lot of similarities between the sophisticated people who like to good food. Okay. Okay. Now, of course, you're very familiar with the first Thanksgiving being from uh, Massachusetts. And I'm sure a lot of you know what they really ate at the first Thanksgiving. And it wasn't turkey. <laughs> or if you didn't know that, you know it now. <laughs> um, but they were very big, especially on seafood. Uh, because being close to the water. Now, New York has that in common with Massachusetts. We once had millions and millions of oysters in New York Harbor. Um, unfortunately, much of the oystering industry has died off. But it's coming back. It's coming off. Um, now, in fact, it was so prevalent, there's a street in New York City called Pearl Street, which bordered the water. And it was called Pearl Street because the oyster shells would wash up on shore and people would look for pearls or see mother of pearl in the shell. And therefore, it became Pearl Street. Now, if you're in that area, by the way, they also have a street downtown by Wall Street called Maiden Lane. 
because the maidens would wash their laundry at the water's edge. And that has been all developed now as part of Wall Street, which is a relatively large neighborhood now. Right. <laughs> and um, this is always an age old question. Do aphrodisiacs work? Oysters were considered aphrodisiacs, but we don't know. We haven't really tested it. But the oyster industry is coming back to New York. In fact, there is a whole move on to harvest um, oysters and then replant them in New York Bay or New York Harbor and try to get them to become abundant again. And it seems to be successful. So we'll see what now, happens. This, this was very New prevalent York. in an area. And if you're not familiar with New York, New York originally in 1624, where uh, $24 was acquired to acquire New York, and it became New Amsterdam. So it wasn't New York originally. That was 1624. By 1664, the English come in, they take over the city, and then they name it after the Duke of York, and it became New York. But this is very prevalent, and food was very dominant in that area. And you can get an idea of some of the foods that they ate at that particular point, but it was a Dutch colony until 1664. Yeah, now, the last thing is notable, uh, not unusual. Uh, Dutch settlers, even children, often drank beer because the water was terrible um, and polluted and had all kinds of contaminants. But if you look at some of the foods that they ate, we still eat a lot of them today. Bread, pretzels, cookies, they were all brought here by the Dutch when they came here. Okay. Now, later on, and here, <laughs> here's some of the stuff that people ate when they came over later on on the ships coming from Europe during the great age of immigration to the United States. Um, not a very hearty meal. Uh, many of them were almost starving by the time they got here because either the food was so bad or they were so seasick they couldn't eat the food. So it was a real big problem. So when they got to Ellis Island... And Ellis Island, by the way, is very near and dear to my heart. My parents are both immigrants. They came here from Romania and Poland. Um, Susan and I are both teachers. And uh, one of the things that was interesting, my first and second year of teaching, I went to Europe. And I told my mother, I said, Mom, I'm so excited I'm going to Europe. And you know what she said to me? Big deal. I was born there. <laughs> and that's a little bit about Ellis Island. But Ellis Island had some very yeah. interesting things. They treated people very nicely, yeah. by the way. It, yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions about Ellis Island. First of all, not everyone who came to New York as an immigrant had to go to Ellis Island. It was only people in steerage, first and second class passengers. Their papers were checked on the boat and they went right to Manhattan. So it was only the poor people who, again, were in steerage. And only 2% of all the people who attempted to come to the United States through Ellis Island were actually sent back. So the idea was not to treat these people badly. So when they got to Ellis Island, they were given foods like this. Look at the menu that they got. They were fed while they were being processed. Sometimes they were only there for several hours while they were processed. Other times it required a couple of days before everything was done. Uh, but here they are sitting at the long tables. Now, one thing, notice, they had china plates. They had silverware. Many of them had never used forks before. They only used knives and spoons. Many of them were only used to eating out of wooden bowls. So this was really very unusual for them to be treated like this. And here were some of the foods that many, many immigrants had never seen in their lives that were considered delicacies. Bananas, white bread, because most of the bread, the European bread especially was dark bread, some kind of jelly, and oranges. So these were all introduced to immigrants coming to New York at Ellis Island. But these people sometimes were taken advantage of, and sometimes they were con artists who would actually sell them things that they said was terrific, could solve all the problems. And here's an example of this thing. This is a, notice the name of this person. This was an, a major con artist who was selling snake oil. In other words, he said it cured everything. This man became was the father of John D. Rockefeller Sr., 
John D. Rockefeller Sr. was before Bezos and Elon Musk was the richest man in the history of America. Rockefeller's, Rockefeller, the son of this particular con artist, uh, became the richest man in America. His equivalent wealth, this is Rockefeller, his equivalent wealth was $183 billion in today's money. But Rockefeller's father was known as Devil Bill because he was selling all the snake oil salesmen. By the way, to tell you what kind of charming the guy was, he was married to one woman. He had a mistress and a, and a whole family in Ohio. His wife was in, in the area of New York. And uh, he also had another mistress. So this guy was quite a character. He'd be away for months with both wives, and they actually accepted what he had. Yeah. Now, along those lines, another very popular item was Coca-Cola. Now, if you don't know this, Coca-Cola got its name because originally it really had cocaine in it. And it was used for a lot of different purposes other than just a nice beverage that we're used to today. Eventually, the cocaine was removed and you have the Coca-Cola that we're used to having today. Now, one place that you could find food and use for different medicinal reasons, for eating reasons, for cooking, for everything was a place called the Cloisters. Now, if you're familiar with New York City, this is a place in the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and it was a cloister. It was a you know for a church and and monks and areas like that. These churches, by the way, and these monks actually were very very creative. And look at the picture on the right hand side. If you go to the cloisters today in New York City, which is terrific, by the way, um, this was you will see gardens that are set up where they had all kinds of things. And one of the things they did have, they had food there that was uh, very unique to them at the time. And later on, we'll talk about a man named Thomas Jefferson, who was very unique in mm -hmm. food. But some of the foods, by the way, that were very prevalent to the immigrants coming to America were and then the first group coming to America in mass. I'm talking about large population is the Irish. And obviously their staple food was potatoes. The picture on the left-hand side, by the way, if you're not familiar with that in New York City, it's by Battery Park City and the World Financial Center. This is across the street from the World Trade Center. And what they did is they brought back buildings and rocks from Ireland, the 32 different counties of Ireland. And one of the things that we talk about when it comes to food is that there was the Irish Hunger Memorial. And by the way, there was an Irish famine. You're probably familiar with that being from New England. And that was um, 1845 to 1852. One million people in Ireland died of starvation that the English had promised they would take care of them. One, one and a half million people wound up coming to America, primarily, as you're well, well aware, to New York and New England and as well, in Boston. But... There was something, by the way, there was a very, very difficult time for the Irish. One of the people who wrote a satire, his name was Jonathan Swift. Jonathan Swift was, you know him as the person who wrote Gulliver's Travels. He wrote something called A Modest Proposal. It was a satire. It was something to show how politically bad the, the English Catholics were, or Protestants were, to the Irish Catholics. And this modest proposal essentially was a recommendation that the Irish should eat their children rather than starve to death. It was a satire, by the way, especially 11-month-olds who are very succulent and soft. <laughs> and yeah, they are. Now, if you, here are some examples of Irish foods that people are familiar with today. If you look at this, you can see uh, cockles and mussels, tripe, all kinds of butter, things like that. There are some other things that people are very familiar with. Seafood pie, fish and chips, Irish stew, Irish coffee, everybody loves. Uh, meat pie, apple pie, brown bread, scones. Those are all very common traditional Irish dishes. Today, now, we're going to go through a lot of different ethnic foods that uh, you may or may not be familiar with. Yeah. Now, if you come to New York and you want to sample some of these foods, the best place to go is an area in the Bronx called Woodlawn. It has the largest Irish population of any area in New York City. Um, to give you perspective, it's about 10 minutes north of Yankee Stadium. I sh shouldn't say that too loud with the Massachusetts crowd, but that's where they are. Yankee fans are talking about it against us. But um, Woodlawn has many, many uh, Irish shops. 
Irish pubs, very prevalent, and also a lot of places where you can sample different Irish foods uh, that you saw previously. So if you ever come to New York and you want to try good Irish food, this is really the place to go. And while you're there, two things you should be aware of. It is the home of a group of people called sand hogs. Now, if you're not familiar with the term, sand hogs are the people that do all the work underground. They did the subways of New York. They did the water tunnels of New York. They did the foundations for the bridges. Um, in Boston, you have a lot of that also. It's a very dangerous job, very well paid. It's generational. People inherit kind of their positions, but their headquarters, a lot of them are Irish, and their headquarters are in this area called Woodlawn. You also have something called Woodlawn Cemetery, which is probably the premier cemetery in the United States. Um, if any of you get a chance, you want to look it up online, look up Woodlawn Cemetery and all the famous people that are buried at Woodlawn. It's Mag amazing. Magnificent, magnificent. It's amazing. But now the people coming from Europe, they came here very often. Uh, they were in the garment industry, but one of the things they did was in the food industry. And here's an example of what New York looked like on the left-hand side. This is Notice there are push carts in here. And that was the way, remember these immigrants came here, very often they couldn't speak the language um, and anything they could do to make a living, they could. So you you drive down the street. This is Little Italy, similar to your Little Italy that you have in, in Boston area. And look at the push carts being sold here. But Mayor LaGuardia, who was the mayor of New York City in 1929-30 and a number of years after that, did not like the push carts. He thought New York City looked very seedy. Mm -hmm. So what he did, actually did is he told the push carts they must move indoors. The picture in the top right hand corner shows you this is a street market in New York City, just like the Boston area. We have ethnic neighborhoods and these ethnic neighborhoods. So LaGuardia was enforcing this and he pushed all these people inside and they became much more prevalent. Yeah. Here's one now, of the new this one is in the lower east side of Manhattan. Later we'll show you another prevalent one, but they were all over the city. This was probably the largest. Uh, but today. You now have the Essex Street Market. It doesn't look like what you're looking at in the picture. This is what it looks like today. So it still has many, many of the foods that were eaten by the immigrants are brought here and processed in the early days. Um, but now, of course, it's much more upscale and they have a lot more um, things that people, younger people tend to want to eat today. Now, throughout the presentation, we'll talk about different ethnic neighborhoods. One of the key ethnic neighborhoods that's still in place now is the one called Arthur Avenue. And people are, and, in, and it's called the Belmont section of the Bronx. This is an Italian neighborhood. These are Italians who came to America to build the Bronx Zoo, to build the Botanical Gardens here. And they settled in this area called Belmont. And uh, a lot of people know it today, and you probably a lot of the people listening in probably know this as Arthur Avenue. By the way, it was named Arthur Avenue because the guy on the right-hand side was the president of the United States, Chester Arthur. By the way, this was owned by the Lorillard family. That's American Tobacco Company. And um, they they were quite uh, they successful. Liked, they liked Chester Arthur, so they named the area in his honor. And here's the Italian neighborhood that is still... Italian market that's still in operation yeah, today. So this is the new Great version prevalent. of the market. Okay. And the premier thing in the market, if you go there, is a place called Mike's Deli. You can see some of the wonderful cheeses and meats hanging from the deli. Um, it's one, considered one of the best in New York. They have some notable people that yeah. constantly will go there for food. Who's this guy on the right-hand side? What's his name? Robert, Robert, <laughs> oh, Robert De Niro. And the guy on the left-hand side who plays a mafia chieftain all the time is Chaz Pamatier. We see him all the time there. And this is the only place they'll buy Italian food. The family in the middle, this is Mike's Deli. They've been there for over a hundred years. By the way, the gentleman over here on the left-hand side, Miguel Greco, passed away a couple of years ago. But when he was 90 years old, he would give demonstrations about making mozzarella and to the women. And he was um, he had been divorced for a number of years and he would propose marriage to all the women with one condition. He wanted to see their bank accounts first. So they have some definitely some characters there and they'll make you a, a, an offer you can't refuse. So in uh, on the right hand side is his son, David, who does 
cheese making demonstrations. Uh, so we're going to show you a little clip of how David makes his cheese and why cheese made in the Bronx is the best. The best. <laughs> the best. Hi guys, I'm David Greco from the Real Little Italy in the Bronx at Mike's Deli. Right now we're making you homemade mozzarella. And mozzarella then becomes burrata, which we consider it the love cheese. I'll show you why. So right now we have our very special curd and our secret ingredient in the Bronx is the Bronx tap water. And the curd is in the hot water and it's being cooked right now and all you use is a pallet. And you overturn the curd and you heat your curd and mix it. And it's all about stretching the curd. And here we go now. So while we're letting that settle, we're gonna to talk to you about what we're gonna stuff the mozzarella with. This is called stracciadella. And this is strips of mozzarella with panna, the Italian cream. And what we do is we get a portion of this panna and the stracciarella, and we get it ready to stuff in the center of the mozzarella. And you're gonna see this is gonna be delicious. This is shiny that curd has gotten. That curd is perfect. We're gonna give it a little stretch. Oh yeah, look at that. And you see when you stretch the cheese, it's when you're making it perfect. Now we're gonna portion this to make you a couple burratas. So now what the burrata is, it's a mozzarella, and you see that shine, look how beautiful. That's when you know, you know, we're talking about it, but honestly, I see that your actions, you guys are hands-on, taste it first. When you taste the mozzarella, you're gonna understand the quality. So this is just mozzarella? Homemade, fresh mozzarella. Okay. This is before it becomes burrata. Right. Oh, wow. Oh, Taste man. The milk. <laughs> ah, soy italiano, I can be. You use your hands. I like that. Wow, that is so good. So fresh. Mm. So now watch what we're going to do. So we get our mozzarella, and now we form it. And guys, why we call it the love cheese is you got to be gentile, gentile. You can't be rough with this cheese. And then you stuff the center with that cream. And then you seal it. And when you seal it, it's very important. You keep all the milk all in the center, and you tuck it, and this becomes burrata. Put burrata for Fred de Casoc. And then once you seal it, it's like a double seal, so no milk leaks out. And then once you seal it, it goes in full water, and it keeps its shape. We're gonna do that again for you guys. And again, it's like making love to the cheese. Andiamo. <laughs> right in the middle. Ah, nice and creamy, and then the double seal. Very important to seal it. Can I ask you, do you think this is pretty simple for like people to learn how to do, or is it something that you think takes years and years of practice? It's a really great question, and the thing is, anybody could do it, but you have to have passion. A big problem in America, machine made, in a rush, doesn't work. It's all about the passion of making the product fresh, and making sure every time you make it, it's perfect. Look at the shine on that mozzarella. You tasted the flavor. You understand the quality. Then, if you're not in the Bronx, you don't have Bronx water, it's a problem. <laughs> because the Bronx water is the best. You guys in Miami have problems. Oh yeah, we can't drink Miami tap water. Are you okay, getting to, hungry yet? <laughs> to give you an idea how good the mozzarella is, <laughs> and smoked mozzarella we buy, it never makes it home by the time we buy it. To give you an idea how good it is, they asked Susan whether she'd rather fool around with me or eat the mozzarella. I have to tell you, she chose the mozzarella. <laughs> okay. But what yeah. about mozzarella, Susan? What's yeah. unique now, about that? Most people think pr prime mozzarella is made from cow's milk, and most of it that we get is, but true mozzarella is actually made from buffalo. Water buffalo. So if you're getting the real thing, you're really getting cheese made from buffalo milk. Now, if you're at Mike's Deli, if you go around the corner, you can go to one of the best bread baking companies probably in the country. This is multi-generational. Multi-generational. 
They make all kinds of wonderful breads. Um, when you walk by at the right time in the morning, the aromas can really get to you. They don't sell to the supermarkets because the supermarkets have to get it out too fast. They will only sell to restaurants and specialty stores because they let the bread sit longer, which means it gets more flavor. This bread is to die for. And again, this is the generational thing with these people. Uh, then you go one more block and you go to Borgatti's, which is <clears throat> considered by Zagat as the best pasta shop in New York City. It's a little hole in the wall, but he makes the best fresh pasta and his raviolis are rated number one in the city. So it's out of this world. So within the three block radius, you can have a whole meal and really enjoy it. Now, now, to give you an idea where this neighborhood is, if you decide to come to New York City and do it, this is about five minute walk from the Bronx Zoo and the Botanical Gardens. And the Botanical Gardens, by the way, just to give you an idea, were owned once by the Lorillard family. Here's the Lorillard family over here on your left-hand side. You you probably know them as P.J. Lorillard. That's American tobacco. They wound up moving to North Carolina. And uh, they're a very wealthy family. They own the grounds. That was the Botanical Gardens, which is about two, 250 acres. And this here's something called a snuff mill. Remember, this company was in the tobacco business that, that was over here. Now, one of the things that we get a kick out of talking about is that this family, the Lorillards, were very wealthy. Here's an example of one of the nephews on the right-hand side. He's always dressed in very formal attire. They're very wealthy people, obviously, because the neighborhood they owned. And um, he got very tired of sitting on his tails of his suit. He had his tail uh, cut up the suit, uh, tails, and redesigned the suit. And they said, what are we going to call this new suit? Because this was the formal attire at the time. When they cut off the tails, they said, well, he couldn't decide what to name the new suit. He said, where do you live? He lived in Tuxedo, New York. Hence, the <laughs> suits became tuxedos. Now, we were talking about one area, um, which is now really the prime Little Italy in New York, if you really want to buy authentic food. But at one time, there were really four Little Italys in New York City. Uh, the one that we showed you at the beginning in the left-hand side is the one people are most familiar with when they come to New York. Um, that's on Mulberry Street. Uh, and it's a great place for restaurants. It's wonderful, okay? But it's not as authentic as far as food making as Arthur Avenue, where we just showed you on the right-hand side. Then you have an area called the South Village, which is part of Greenwich Village, also very prevalent. Now, if you look um, at the statue, that is Gar Giuseppe Garibaldi, who was the father of modern Italy. And his statue actually sits in Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village because this was a very heavily Italian neighborhood. The last one is on the right, and that was actually the largest Little Italy. Um, it was East Harlem. Um, it's now really Spanish Harlem if you go there today, but that was a huge Italian neighborhood. Now, when people think of Italian food, one of the most famous foods, of course, is pizza. And when Queen Margarita wanted to try peasant food, when she went to Naples, the people of the town made something for her uh, of cheese and dough and tomato sauce and some basil. And of course, that became pizza. Okay. Well, one thing that's very interesting is that a lot of the immigrants coming to America in all cultures, everyone, whether it was Jewish, Italian, or Chinese, or anything, there was always a little bias and a lot of uh, negative things about the people until they got finally accepted. But some people, some actors and some celebrities and some historians became actually destroy, destroying some of the stereotyping that was there. One guy in particular really helped endorse the Italian community, and you probably remember him as Dean Martin. Now, if you're not familiar with Dean Martin and how talented he was with his partner, Jerry Lewis, who happened to be Jewish, here's a little bit of a Dean Martin and give you an idea of the kind of personality he had and how he warmed up people to be in the Italian and to accept the Italian community in the world. Joe, like old time, you sing a song for Mama. Oh, see? no, Ma, not in front of all oh. these people. Joe, you sing it for Mama. <laughs> in Napoli, 
where love is king When boy meets girl Here's what they sing When the moon hits your eye Like a big pizza pie That's an old day When the world seems to shine Like you've had too much wine That's a day Bells will ring, ting-a-ling-a-ling, ting-a-ling-a-ling, and you'll sing Vita Bella. Bravo, John. Hearts will play, tippy-tippy-tay, tippy-tippy-tay, like a gay darandella. Lucky fella. When the stars make you drool, just like pasta basil, that's amore. When you dance down the street with a cloud at your feet, you're in love. When you walk in a dream, but you know you're not dreaming, Signora. Mama! Excuse me, but you see back in old Napoli, that's Signora. If you still kiss your girl after garlic and oil, that's Signora. That's Signora. Lots of water, bells will ring. Ting a ling a ling, ting a ling a ling. You'll sing beat the bell. Beat the bell, beat the bell. Hearts will play. Tippy tippy day, tippy tippy day. I could get that and then love. Arabella. When the stars make you drool, just like a pasta fazool. That's amore. That's amore. When you dance down the street with the cloud at your feet, you're in love. But you know, you're not dreaming. And you're Excuse me, but you see back in old Napoli. That's a worry. Tutte quante cantate, everybody sing. When the moon... Okay, there it is. Uh, you probably remember Dean Martin's... Um, uh, cohort Joseph Levitch. Well, he changed his name to Jerry Lewis. Right. But in New York City, if you want to go to and his bragging rights we have with Connecticut and Massachusetts, what was the first Italian, uh, pizzeria, Italian in New pizzeria in New York City? Lombardi's takes the credit in New York City going back to the early days. Right. In Brooklyn, there's another pizzeria that is actually terrific. Called Romaldi's. Romaldi's. And that's right under, you can see the Brooklyn Bridge on the right-hand side. And they do something very interesting. They put on, when they make pizza, they put on the cheese first and then the sauce on top of it. Because they don't want the cheese to burn. So they have a very unique thing. It's a great, a great restaurant. We took uh, English uh, television uh, there to eat, and they were thrilled. <laughs> right. Now, if you go to the Little Italy on Mulberry Street, again, the most famous place, uh, Many people go to Ferrara's for dessert. Uh, they are probably the premier um, dessert-making paste for Italian pastries, like cannolis and cream puffs and eclairs. Wonderful. They've been in business, you know, you can see since 1892 and still going strong. Uh, if you go down the street and you want to sample, again, cheeses and meats, if you're in that area, you can go to DiPaolo's which is also in that particular area. And like Mike's Deli, they have been in business over 100 years also. So if you're in Manhattan and you don't want to get all the way up to the Bronx, the Paolo's is wonderful. Okay. Now, let's show you some movie scenes that are famous for culinary delights. Some of these really need no introduction. Speaking of pasta and spaghetti, I'm sure you will recognize this <laughs> lady in the tramp. Here's one of the most famous scenes in America. This is uh, John Travolta. Look at this, a double slice. In Saturday on top Night of each other. <laughs> There was a movie called Splash. Okay, look at Splash, okay. which is Daryl Hannah and uh, Tom Hanks. He looks a little different now today. I love the way she's eating and lobster. She was eating lobster. No, like, no New England New England lobster like that. No, that's definitely New England. <laughs> okay. Now, of course, 
There's a lot of delicacies. Here's a delicacy, chilled monkey brains. And that's one of the things we serve on some of our foods. This is Cape uh, uh, Capture. Capture. And this is Mar He's married, by the way, to Steven Spielberg. Yeah. This is and Indiana let, Jones Temple of Doom. Okay, a okay. great scene in American in, history. Now, if you love hard-boiled eggs. <laughs> cool Dan Luke, what are you, 50 of them, 50 I think? 50 of them in the, in the movie. Okay, that was a bet that he had. And here is a very famous movie scene also involving food. It doesn't require many words. Watch Heroes, whatever high ideals we may have of them, are mortal, not divine. We are all as God made us, and many of us much worse. We hope this is inspiring you to, um, but, but stay with us, though. Stay with us. Tom Jones. Uh, and by the way, of course, modern days, by the way, there are some unique stores. This is, um, if, you, if you're a Seinfeld fan, you remember, you might remember a segment called the Soup Nazi. And look at in the middle picture over here. This is actually his, what, he has a number of stores now. The guy has really become quite popular. This is on 55th Street and 8th Avenue. And uh, we, we actually had the real Kramer on our radio show uh, one uh, evening, and uh, Al uh, is is quite a character, and he is exactly like he portrays. He in the doesn't week. say no soup for you, <laughs> okay? He doesn't want his customers there to buy soup. So. Well, he's franchised this thing yeah. out. He's done yeah, quite exactly. well for himself. Okay. And speaking of food, if any of you want to keep vampires away, you know, just eat garlic, and it'll keep them. But away. let's go to another area. Another the neighborhood so we, we, with we, great we food is Harlem which is great for soul food. And there's a couple of great restaurants in there. One is Sylvia's and they have a great menu for things. Um, Jacob's Restaurant, Amy Ruth, which is one of our favorites. Which is our favorite. There. Mm -hmm. Okay. And here's the Red Rooster. This is where President Obama looked to your right hand side is having a, a meal there. And Manners, that's kind of a, a place of uh, actually. Um, it's kind of like the McDonald's. Buffet. Of it's kind of a <laughs> buffet. Great restaurant food though. There. Very good food there. And of course, if you go one of the premier dishes to try if you've never had it is chicken and waffles. It's very Southern, uh, but it's brought to Harlem and it's in any of these restaurants, it's one of the best things on the menu. Well, let's move on to another neighborhood. Let's talk about Chinatown. Chinatown has become very successful. Remember the Chinese came to America to dig gold eventually when they wound up building the Transcontinental Railroad. And eventually, when they were being abused by Americans, these cowboys, uh, they wound up moving to New York. Um, but there was a law called the 1882 Exclusion Act, which really was prohibiting Chinese from coming to America. So the Chinese population early on were only men. By the way, in 1910, there were 3,000 Chinese men living in this area of Chinatown and only 36 women. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole other story. We do a yeah. whole thing on ethnic foods when we do Chinatown. Now, when the Chinese men came here, there were really only two occupations that they could do. One was Chinese laundry. Some of you may remember that. I know my parents used them all the time. And the other was anything food related. They could be cooks. They could be waiters. They could even own restaurants. Why? 
because it was considered women's work and white men would not do either of those two occupations, but it was okay for the Chinese. If you see the picture over here, this is the late 1800s now. It's Mott it, Street in New York, which is Chinese the Chinese have just street. come here, and this was a bachelor society. They were only, and you, you saw the population before, only primarily men. Right. Women were not allowed. That law eventually was repealed in the 1940s. Now, they did have a very elegant restaurant down there on Mott Street called Port Arthur Restaurant. And that was frequented by some of the wealthier New Yorkers who kind of wanted to dabble and see what Chinese food was all about. You can see it's pretty elegant looking in its day. And one of the most interesting guests that ever came here was a man named Sun Yat Sen, who was considered the father of modern day China. He actually lived upstairs above the restaurant and he came here to learn about American democracy. And that's why he was here. And so he frequently went downstairs to eat at the Port Arthur restaurant. Now, one of the fun things you can do, and we've done this in the Boston area many times, is go for something called dim sum. A dim sum is like appetizer, like pop tapas. And uh, dim sum literally means a dot of the heart. Because the Chinese live, uh, eat to live, and we live to eat. Right. So it's a different philosophy. They yeah. have a much different philosophy on food. They take a lot of pride in their food itself. Yeah. Now, the oldest um, dim sum restaurant in New York is called the Namwa Tea Palace. It is also about 100 years old. So if you come to New York and you want really authentic dim sum, this is the place to go. Now, one of the dishes that's served in many American Chinese restaurants is chop suey, but chop suey is really not Chinese. Um, it really means mixed bits. And what it was is when Chinese cooks went along, when they were building the Transcontinental Railroad, they had to feed the other Chinese workers. So what they were given is bits of things from what the white railroad workers ate and the Chinese cooks were asked to concoct a dish for them to eat. Leftovers. And, Basically, it became either chow mein or chop suey. And so if you go to China, you can't ask for chop suey. They will have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Now, when you go to Chinatown, and I'm sure if you go to Chinatown, especially in Boston, you see this, uh, ducks hanging from the window. Most of these are barbecued or roast duck. But a delicacy, of course, in the Chinese is what you're seeing on the right. That is called Peking duck, which is done a totally different process. It's not inexpensive. Many restaurants tell you you need about a half hour if you want to wait for it to be cooked. Uh, there is one restaurant, though. There's one on Mott Street and one in Midtown called the Peking Duck House. And that's basically what everybody comes for. So there you don't have to so wait. Left-hand side is roast duck. Right-hand side is Peking Duck. Right. Now, the restaurants in Chinatown, there are over 400 of them there. That's how large. Our Chinatown is much, much larger. We have the largest Chinese population in America in New York City. We have 750,000 Chinese living in different areas of New York City, and that continues to grow and get bigger and bigger. The food is outstanding. And here's one of the restaurants that you can see. You can see it. They're, they're hole in the wall. One day, see this restaurant we're looking at right now in the lower point? One day we were walking, we were eating in there, and to the left where that man and the woman are sitting was Billy Crystal and Queen Latifah was taking food out of the restaurant. This is this restaurant, uh, I'll call it a dump, but it's pretty <laughs> dumping. But to give you an idea of what it's like, um, I did a, a, a tour and here is, you'll get to see who what I look like. And uh, this is what, our favorite restaurant. Please do not go here. We're tired of waiting online. But here is uh, Wohop, one of the oldest restaurants in New York City. Used to be, by the way, many years ago, a brothel. So it's no longer that. But here's a little quick interview I did with the owner of Wohop. Okay, we're at Wohop, our favorite restaurant in Chinatown, with one of our favorite people, my cousin Ming. Hi, how, how are you, Ming? Good, 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 thank you. What type of restaurant is this? What uh, this is a Chinese restaurant. What kind of cuisine is it? Uh, actually, it's uh, sapsui and sichuan. 
It's more Cantonese than anything. Uh, yeah, another thing is Cantonese, but we are not uh, Cantonese. So we are old-fashioned Chinese food. Okay, so how many yeah. years have this uh, uh, Since 1938. 1938? Yeah. Okay. And what's the capacity of this restaurant? Uh, for people. How many people can fit in the restaurant? Uh, 40. 40 people, yeah, okay. 40 seats, yeah. Now we can tell you this is one of the best restaurants in Chinatown and people come here and they wait on line at night to just get in here. And Ming is the best. Thank you, right, thank you, Ma. Okay, thank you very Ming. much. Okay. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Now, th this restaurant, Wo Hop, has an international flavor, but also people from all of the United States. Now, you guys are from where? Arizona. Arizona. Have you ever eaten here before? No, this is the first time. How's the food? It's amazing. It's really good. It's you know, great. you have to wait on line here during normally on weekends to do this. <laughs> you came all the way from Arizona. What did you hear? How did you hear about the place? I just looked it up online. You just looked it up online. <laughs> I think you right looked up the best Chinese places, and this is. And this is true. And you guys are from Arizona. That's in the United States, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> We're just kidding. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy your food, and we're sure we're glad you guys came. And this has this restaurant has the best reputation. Just to give you an idea, behind us one day, we we're, were here in the restaurant, and you know who was eating there? Billy Crystal, right? And Queen Latifah was taking food out of here. So to give you an idea, what a cool restaurant this is. Yeah, and our pictures are hanging up on the wall over there. We, ha we host a radio show in New York City. Okay, well, thank you guys very much. Enjoy your food. And then tell them Shay Shay. That means thank you in, in Chinese. Shay Shay. Okay. okay, now if you go down there, one of the cool things to do is to visit the Chinese market when you're down there. And there are several. Some of them are almost a block long. And you'll see all of these foods. Here are some of the things that you can eat. Now, as Art mentioned, the Chinese have a philosophy. Americans eat to live. The Chinese live to eat. They literally eat everything. They do not waste a thing. Oh, they looks the the pork <laughs> uterus. A dollar sixteen. They raised the price, Susan, to three dollars and fifty cents oh, okay. a pound. Look at pork uterus. As bad as it looks, it probably tastes worse than that. Yeah. Okay, but, <laughs> but that's not one of the delicacy. I mean, some of you might have eaten alligator, but you usually eat like alligator <laughs> that's barbecued or fried or something. But look, you can buy claws. I mean, unbelievable. A lot of live stuff like eels. And but fresh food, fresh and frogs, everything you can get in these markets. It's really amazing. And the cheap, cheap prices compared to what they are in a suburban fish market or supermarket. Now, while you're down there and you need something to help your digestion, they have herbal medicine stores. Look on the right hand side. This is called Lynn Sister, and it's an herbal store. We go there quite often. We have this thing where it's Chinese Bengay. It's the most amazing things. And if you see over here, what they're doing, they're mixing things up all for medicinal reasons. These are licensed herbalists to do that. The woman over here, you see a piece of, her name is Shay. And by the way, I introduce her as being 140 years old. And she gives me a dirty look when I say that. No, all kidding aside. Yeah. But let's move on to another Chinatown that has become almost as big as the original Chinatown. And this is a place called Flushing Queens. Queens right. And very large Chinatown. Also, another emerging Chinatown is in an area called Sunset Park, which is in Brooklyn. Um, and they tend to be much less crowded if you go there, um, especially on the weekends if you're visiting New York. But also equally excellent food, all varieties, and you can really sample. Now, where do a lot of these things come from? Well, there's a place in the Bronx called the Hunts Point Market. And every day... Fresh produce, fresh meat is brought into the market. And many of these restaurateurs at two, three, four in the morning will go and buy all of their fresh wares. Now, their now New York City today has about 15,000 restaurants in New York City, all different kinds. By the way, before the pandemic, there were about 20,000 restaurants, so quite a number of restaurants. And I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you're not familiar with. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost a lot of restaurants financially uh, to do that. So, But they're still living strong, and a lot of them are coming back right now. Right. Now, the other thing that they go for is fresh fish. Um, they used to come to a place called the Fulton Fish Market, which was down on the east side of Manhattan near an area called the South Street Seaport. Uh, but then it became too congested to have these large fish markets down there. So what they did was they moved it up to the Bronx, very close to Hunts Point, and 
Here's what the markets look like. Look at the area they have now. So again, you you as a you know an individual can go there at two, three, four in the morning and buy fresh fish. We have done yourself. that before. We have done that. <laughs> but you know, it's mainly for um, restaurant tours and grocery stores and supermarkets. But again, everything is super fresh and daily, so you're getting some of the freshest fish and fruits and vegetables well, that you can. Let, let's move on, by the way, to another neighborhood that you probably all have heard about called the Lower East Side. And, and again, this is all over America, not just in New York. And this is primarily German and Jewish neighborhood. If you look over here to your right-hand side, it's called Strauss Square. This is A&S Strauss. This is the people who bought Macy's department store. And look over here in the top left-hand corner. Look what's pulling this um, probably a milk wagon. They're pigs. New York mm -hmm. City had lots of wild pigs running around the streets. And they got fat from eating garbage. And then what did you do with them? You eventually wound up eating them. Lower left hand left hand corner. This is a woman who was observing a kitchen in the Lower East Side. These are tenement uh, apartments. That woman, by the way, you notice how tall she is. That is Eleanor Roosevelt. That is Franklin Roosevelt's wife. Right. She was quite big on immigration and helping people do that. Now, why this is called Strauss Square? The Strausses were the people who eventually bought Macy's department store, very wealthy, and the Strausses wanted to give back to New York City. So what they would do is there were a lot of poor children living in these tenements that didn't have any kind of refrigeration, nothing like that. So every single day, the Strausses would sponsor these milk wagons who would come across the river from New Jersey with fresh milk and distribute it to the families on the Lower East Side. And that's why he's on it. Now, people always ask us, what's, you see food carts all over the city and you see restaurants and they're marked either kosher or halal. And people are always asking, you know, what's with this? They have a lot of similarities between the two. Okay. Um, the major thing, um, the different, uh, the major similarity they have is neither will eat pork. Okay. Or any kind of animal that doesn't have what's called a cloven hoof. So many, many things are you know, forbidden from both groups. And you can kind of see the difference um, as you go along uh, with the food carts. They become more and more popular in New York City. You know, a delicacy for the people coming from Eastern Europe, one of the things that they like doing is they like something called an egg cream. Now, you're probably familiar with an egg cream. Here is something. This is an appetizing store. A lot of these uh, places like Ratner's in the top left-hand corner, that was a dairy restaurant. Meat was expensive, dairy was cheaper. And that's why uh, you be, preserved foods became very popular and um, uh, dairy became even more popular because it was less expensive. One of the things that people enjoyed in the New York area was something called an egg cream. And I remember I went to college in Indiana and I told them I wanted an egg cream. They looked at me like I was crazy. And they said, where's the egg go? Well, it doesn't. <laughs> but here is one an example of an appetizing store. Look at pickled herring and chopped herring and eggplant and things like that, mainly dairy food. But now there's a famous restaurant that is still flourishing today. And I mean flourishing. It's a restaurant called Katz's Deli and Katz's Deli. Now, we drive, we drive by there all the time. And look at the sign over here. It says Katz's Deli, that's all. Now, let's go to the next slide and you'll see something. And we say that's all. People always ask us, what does this mean? Well, Mr. Katz comes to America, and he opens up a, a deli, and he wanted a sign painter uh, to paint a, a sign for him saying, this is Katz's Deli. And he said, so the man comes to Mr. Katz, who was a European immigrant with a heavy accent, and he says, Mr. Katz, what do you want on your uh, um, a sign? He says, hey, Katz's Deli, that's all. So that's what he literally he put on his literally. restaurant. And that's, so this restaurant's been over there for 80 years. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a famous scene in Katz's Deli that has been a classic in American film and comedy. And this is a movie called Harry Met Sally. And like this is Meg Ryan and Billy Crystal. And this is one of the famous scenes. So we thought you'd enjoy, if you haven't seen this, a little bit again with Meg Ryan acting. Okay. Yeah. What was that supposed to mean? Nothing. It's just that all men are sure it never happened to them, and most women at one time or another have done it, so you do the math. 
You don't think that I could tell the difference? No. Get out of here. Oh. Oh. Ooh. Are you okay? Oh. I'll have what she's having. That woman in the scene, by the way, is the director's mother. This is Rob Ryan. Uh, Ryan. Rob Ryan. Ryan. Rob mother. Reiner. And this is his mother. I'll have what she's having. One of the classic scenes in American comedy. Terrific. Billy Crystal. Now, speaking about comedy, here is an interesting family. This young woman, you, I'm sure you all recognize her. This is Marilyn Monroe. This is probably towards the end of her career when she was a superstar. She winds up marrying this man over here. His name is Arthur Miller, probably one of America's greatest playwrights. Now, Arthur Miller, by the way, is Jewish. Marilyn converted to Judaism. A lot of people don't realize that. She was also married to Arthur Miller longer than she's ever been married to anyone else over five years. And, and she's uh, marrying her. She converts to Judaism. And now she's meeting her family, Arthur Miller's family, mother and father, for one of the first times. And here she is. And uh, they're all laughing. Now, this is a new daughter-in-law for them. And they want their daughter-in-law to feel comfortable now the fact that she's married to their son and she's now Jewish. So what do they serve her? Something to make her feel very much at home. They serve her matzo ball soup. She sits down at the dinner table after her mother-in-law told her what it is. She takes one look at this and says to her mother-in-law, Mom, is there any other part of the matzo I could eat? Now, the people listening in probably think I'm making that up. Absolutely, this is true. For years, Marilyn would kid around and say, is there any part of the matzo she could eat? And right. this is a great story about matzo ball soup, right. which is very medicinal. Now, if you're down on the Lower East Side near Katz's and what they have there doesn't appeal to you, you can go down the block to a place called Russ and Daughters. It is the last of all the true appetizing stores there where they serve white fish and pickled herring and all kinds of smoked salmon. Now, most places, if you go into a supermarket or something, they may have two varieties of smoked salmon, but here they have about 20 different varieties, all sliced fresh. Again, it's a tiny, tiny little store, but the lines go out the door. Um, they become so successful They've actually opened a couple of restaurants in New York City. One of them is at a place called Hudson Yards, which is the newest building complex in New York City. And they also have a little place on the Lower East Side. If you don't have time to take, or you can't take the food with you, you can sample it there. Now, the immigrants coming here, remember they had food. Meat was expensive again. Pickled food was very reasonable and could be preserved much better. Here is a place called the Pickle Guy. And you're in the lower right-hand corner. If you walk in there, they have an incredible amount of pickled Whatever. Things, <laughs> things. We defy you if you come into this particular place for pickles, that if your mouth doesn't stop watering, <laughs> there's something wrong with you. It is amazing. Mm -hmm. These are the best pickles you have ever eaten in your life. We buy them by the gallon. Right. And another place to stop by is something called Kosar's. Um, Kosar's tell two basic things that you may be familiar with. One, of course, is bagels, and they sell all varieties of bagels. 
And New York is considered the best bagels in the country. Why are they better? Well, actually, David Greco gave you the answer. It's the water in New York makes the bagels the way they are. And it's very hard to duplicate it anywhere else in the country. But Kosos is famous for something else that some of you may not be familiar with. These are called Bialis. Bialis are more, they're more like a pizza, almost like a pizza crust with a lot of onion. They shape like a bagel, but they're much lighter in weight than a bagel is. And this is one of the last places in New York that you can actually get fresh Bialis. Now, here's something you'll only see in New York and probably nowhere else in, in the country. This is something called a pletzo. Okay, it's a, called an onion board. It's an onion board. Now, we have a friend who was a priest. He wrote a book called Food from the Bible. And it's all about food that you'd hear about in the Bible and things you have there. And one of the things he talked about is pretzel. When he sent the book to the publishing company, the publishing company came back to him and said, do you mean pretzel? And he says, no, pretzel. It's an onion board. And they went back and forth and back and forth. Eventually, they understood that it's called a pretzel, and it's really terrific. It's a, like a giant Bialy. Bialy to do that. <laughs> really good. Now, there's another place, and very traditional Jewish place. This is called, this is a knish. We had a young kid, by the way, call up, and he called, he loved, he was a foodie, and he says he wanted to eat a nish. I said, what's a nish? <laughs> and he couldn't pronounce the K. And here is Alex, by the way. They serve, that's all they serve here at knishes. And about 12 varieties of conditions. And again, look when it started. When you, walk, when you walk into the floor, by the way, it's all cockeyed and, and it's tilted. And the place has been there forever. But this is the most famous Kanish store in the United States. Right, exactly. Now, just as a little aside, did you ever wear, wonder where some of the foods that you eat come from? Okay, we'll just quickly give you a few of them just to sample. Okay, a hamburger started in Hamburg, Germany. That's where it's got its name from. Uh, Caesar salad, you think started somewhere in Italy? No, it was created in Tijuana, Mexico. Uh, Nutella, which has become really popular, again, started in Italy. Popsicles were actually invented almost by accident out in California um, and all different flavors of that. Buffalo wings, of course, have nothing to do with buffaloes, uh, but they were started at a place called the Anchor Bar in Buffalo, and that's how they got their names. General Chow's chicken, kind of like chow mein and uh, chop suey, is really an American creation, has nothing to do with China. Um, ketchup, this surprised us, actually comes from China. Okay? It does not come from where you would think it would come from. Uh, cheesecake you think is kind of a New York invention. No, uh, they found recipes from the ancient Greeks had it. Uh, breakfast sandwiches, chocolate chip cookies, also kind of made by accident when the woman ran out of things. Now, two things that are famous that I'm sure you all know is the Waldorf salad. When Waldorf salad was introduced at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, by a man named Chef Boyardi. <laughs> and he was an immigrant that came over eventually, got work at the Waldorf. Um, and of course, he also was the man behind Chef Boyardi, uh, canned Italian goodies. Now, one of the fun, fun things to do in New York City is go to some places that there are, there are a few of them in New York, not that many, only a couple. And this is called, called Economy Candy. And they have it. And I remember walking in here and seeing candy that... I hadn't seen since my childhood. And I looked at the owner and I said, Jerry, uh, I haven't seen this food for, for, for years. Where is it from? He says, it's been sitting in the basement for the last 40 years. Of course, he was kidding around. This is a food heaven, if you candy, candy heaven, <laughs> if you like it. <laughs> okay. And we've had people walk out of there with 20 people, and they wound up spending about $500 on candy. You might remember some of them, dots on the paper, you have it, Pez machines. And the thing that candy cigarettes, Holivar, fresh Holivar, which is cutting down a fresh, they cut it fresh. And then my favorite that I always push people to buy are waxed lips. That's in the beginning. That's really quirky mm -hmm. and fun, but they you won't see that in almost anywhere in the country. Now, a guy has a daughter, this guy you've probably heard of, the guy over here on the left-hand side, his name is Ralph Lifshitz. 
you probably know Ralph Lifshitz. He changed his name to Ralph Loren. Okay. Can you imagine wearing mm -hmm. Lifshitz clothing? And here is his daughter. And she has, her name is Dylan. And she opened up this incredible candy store to compete against the other store. The bad economy and candy. This, and look yeah. at this thing. This is huge. This yeah. is three floors. Now, it used to be near Bloomingdale's, if you're familiar with Bloomingdale's in Manhattan. But now it has moved to also a place called Hudson Yards. Um, and very large candy store. She also sells fresh ice cream and adult candies, <laughs> which have liquor in them and kind of adult creamsicles in and things like that. So it's a great place to go. Now, speaking of candy, there is a classic TV scene, uh, which many of you will remember involving candy. Hey there. All right, girls. Now, this is your last chance. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Yes, ma'am. Let her roll! <laughs> Remember classic blue seal ball, I uh, think. Okay, here's a great scene: James Cagney and May Clark <laughs> getting and... a grapefruit in her face <laughs> as her dessert. Uh, now, speaking of desserts, we mentioned Ferraras before. Uh, this is another pastry store. This is in the East Village called Veneros. You can see it dates back to 1894. They also have absolutely wonderful. Pastries, if you like Italian pastries, cappuccino, espresso, all kinds of things. It's wonderful. Okay, now a cuisine that has taken off in New York, probably in the last about 10, 12 years, that wasn't so popular in New York is Indian food. Uh, I don't know how much Indian food is now available in. Uh, your area, there's but, a lot. There's but a it's lot. become much more popular in New York. Uh, there's a couple of areas in Manhattan. One is on 6th Street, and it's nicknamed Little Bombay. There's another area on Lexington Avenue called Curry Road, because it's so many Indian restaurants. Uh, but the true Indian neighborhood in New York City is Jackson Heights, Queens, where not only do they have restaurants, but they have all kinds of shops to buy jewelry and salaries and all kinds of things that you can think of. Um, it's also where the largest percentage of Indian Americans live in New York City. They don't really live in much in Manhattan. They live in this part we of the do. city. We have a contract with an Indian-based company, and we take people into New York City. They only eat Indian food. <laughs> and Indian food is terrific. Look over here on the right-hand side. This is called tandoori chicken. Right. And they have all kinds of appetizers, many wonderful breads, if you're not familiar with it. And this tandoori chicken, by the way, is is put in a clay oven. And it's in in, in, a, in a heat goes around it. And you had the bread on the wall. That's called non bread. Right. Non -bread. And there is a Hindu temple, by the way, that we go to in Queens. 
where they have also a very nice restaurant there. Here's the Hindu Queens. By the way, we meet there. There's a gentleman we meet there. He is the nicest, gentlest man you'll ever see. He has a dot on his forehead, Labindi. And um, he is just a sweetheart of a man. And he refers to himself as GP. GP. He's like the docent and the historian for this particular temple. And the reason he refers to himself as GP, because his name is so long that he can't even pronounce it. I'm kidding, of course. Right. Okay. Now, now, if you go to the temple, if you're not familiar with Indian food and you want to visit the temple and kind of get an idea what Indian things are like, they have a wonderful cafeteria, very inexpensive, and you can sample food. By the way, if you're not familiar with Indian food, a lot of people think it's very, very spicy, and it can be. Believe me, we just came back from India. We know that. But you can get many, many, many things that are mildly seasoned, mildly spiced, that are absolutely wonderful. Now, there is something being done right now in Jersey, which is about an hour and a half south of uh, of New York City. Um, it is a Mandir in a place called Robbinsville, New Jersey. This will be the largest complex of Indians, uh, Indian population and Hindu temples anywhere in the world. And it's being built. You can see what the buildings look like and the interior. This is all, a lot of it was built in India and shipped over here. I, well, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but it is magnificent. Yeah. And if you want to see something, um, yeah. it's terrific. And they also have a food market in there, again, where you can buy things and sample and, and taste some of the The delicacies. nicest people and, and they're very willing to educate you, and it's free to the public. Right. Now, some of the other Asian cuisines, we talked about Chinese and Indian. You have Korean food. Uh, some of it, to me, does not look too appetizing. Uh, some of it they serve to you live, and you have to eat it while it's still living. Uh, and then they have several, of course, Japanese restaurants. One of our favorites is called Ninja um, in the Tribeca area of New York City, but they're all over the city. Now, if you go to Coney Island in Brooklyn, which is the southern tip of Manhattan or New York City, um, you will see a place called Brighton Beach. Brighton Beach is a Russian and Georgian neighborhood. And the Russian and Georgian are very different kind of rivals and they'll and there's a boardwalk over here look on the lower right hand corner you'll see that it's a, a boardwalk where you can eat outdoors there these people are mainly from russia area and georgia and uh, this is brighton beach the dish on the top is one of our favorites it's called kachapuri it's multiple cheeses it's like a i guess the China, uh, equivalent so like a white pizza, a, a, almost, pizza. a white pizza. but let's move on i talked in the beginning we told you a little bit about someone who was very much of a foodie. His name was Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was our third president. Now, he spent, if you know the movie Hamilton, by the way, and the show Hamilton, Broadway show, the second act in the first song is What Did I Miss? Hamilton spent most of his Jefferson. time during the, Jefferson, sorry, spent most of his time in Europe negotiating with the French to help us fight against the British during the Revolutionary War. He was a foodie. He was very much into food, and he brought food back. When he came back after the Revolutionary War, came back to America, he made certain things popular. Once he became president, it became even more popular. What are the dishes, mm -hmm. Susan? He brought French fries, of course. <laughs> he brought the recipe how to make ice cream, uh, creme brulee, macaroni and cheese, which was one of his favorites. And one other dish. And then he brought something called poison apples. Poison apples. Hmm, what are poison apples? Well, Americans didn't know. Those are tomatoes. And he made tomatoes relevant in the United States after he brought them back from France. Now, there's a wonderful place in Greenwich Village. Again, it's a little tiny hole in the wall. They make something called pomme frites, which are Belgian fries, not French fries. The Belgian fries are what they call twice cooked, and they're absolutely delicious, and they serve them with all kinds of interesting sauces that you can try, um, and it's a great place to sample food if you're in New York City. Now, during, you, know, you had a lot of wealthy people, and here's a man named, the man over here on the right-hand side, his name is Peter Cooper. Peter Cooper was a very successful businessman, multi-millionaire in today's dollars. This is a school that he put together. It was a free college for a number of years. It's no longer 100% free, but it's still, you had to present a portfolio here. 
and you got scholarships here. And originally, again, you didn't have to pay. It was called Cooper Union. Abraham Lincoln actually spoke in that. Here in the top left-hand corner is Abraham Lincoln making a speech. The speech was, right makes might. Okay. And this was, uh, he eventually, this is 1861, before he became president of the United States. And he made this speech. No one knew who he was. And the press here, this man speaking, they said he's absolutely terrific. Here's what it looks like today. Now, how did Mr. Cooper make his money besides having this? He invented the I-beam on the top left-hand corner from building uh, building buildings. He also um, built the first Tom Thumb engine. This is the, the lower right-hand corner. But he also invented one other thing that made him popular. It had to and do with food. <laughs> and it was Jell-O. Okay, he invented Jell-O. And that was Peter Cooper. Here is a place, by the way, in New York City is very popular for hot dog vendors and, you know, other pretzel vendors and peanut vendors and things like that. Here's something that we thought you'd find unusual and, and unique. The, the, see the vending machine, the vending cart over here? New York City um, has lots of these. And how do you make sure? Here's the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is probably the most popular museum in New York City. And there are thousands and thousands of people there. So to have a hot dog vendor there and a food vendor there would be very, very successful. How do you make sure that there isn't a million hot dog vendors there? Well, first of all, they have every vendor bid for location. Yeah, you pay $400 to get a license for a year, which sounds very reasonable, right? But as Art said, you want to make sure you don't have everybody in the same location. So every year you have to bid for location to rent a space to put your food cart. Well, here is one interesting example of what a food cart costs. Right near the Central Park Zoo, the man pays $289,500 a year to have his food cart there. A year. Okay. But guess what? He makes a profit. Okay. They all make a profit when they go there. So, but one thing, if you ever come to New York and you go to a food cart, the p prices are supposed to be posted on the cart. Very often they're not. So before you buy anything, always ask how much something costs. Because when they get really crowded and people line up, they will charge you whatever they feel like charging you. And if you're not aware of what you're buying, unfortunately, some of them will really try to rip just, you off. Just caution so you. Just but let, let, let's move on a positive note to another restaurant. Okay. The first restaurant in New York City. This is the main famous restaurant in New York called Delmonico's. And here is what it looks like today. Not much different than it looked like uh, when it first opened. Now, the thing about Delmonico's, Delmonico's was the first restaurant in the United States that presented menus to its patrons. Before that, you would walk into an establishment and say, what do you have to eat today? And he'd say, well, this is what we made. Delmonico's had menus. And the interesting thing was, if you came as a couple, which in those days, most people did, only the men would have the prices on the menu. Women would never have the prices. Okay. But many famous things were invented in Delmonico's. You had first Delmonico steak, which you see on the left. They introduced baked Alaska. They introduced Eggs Benedict, all came from there. And one other very interesting dish. There was a dish made with one a gentleman comes in here. His name is Benjamin Wenberg. And he comes in here and he wants the dish. And he tells the Delmonica brothers, who are Swiss, he says he wants them to make him a dish that you've never made before. And it was with Cognac and sherry and eggs and lobster and, and lobster and all and, and they call and the dish was very successful after they they served it to other people and they called it his name was uh, Benjamin Wenberg they called it lobster Wenberg and on the menu today if you go there today now have you heard of uh, lobster Wenberg most of you are shaking your head saying no well what happened is Mr Wenberg comes in and he gets into a fight with one of Delmonico brothers. They throw him out of the restaurant. They said, don't you ever come back here again. Not only that, we're going to change the name of that Lobster Wenberg. And they took it and they called it Lobster Newberg. They actually took it 
uh, by reversing. To the WE had a made in any W. So it became Lobster Newberg, and you all know that dish, Lobster Newberg, today. Right. And it started at this restaurant called <clears throat> Delmonico. Delmonico. Now, one of the other oldest restaurants in New York is called Pete's Tavern, which is in an area called Gramercy Park. And if you look at the sign, it says, The Tavern O. Henry Made Famous. That's because the writer O. Henry actually sat and wrote several of his short stories while sitting in a booth. They are the most famous um, being, um, oh, I just drew he, the importance of, what did he write? I just drew Well, the importance so, of being earnest. Right. And um, he wrote things. That, but, he, but he wrote another story. He wrote Ransom of Red Chief. Right. For all his things. But he also um, had... Uh, oh, Gift of the Magi. <laughs> Gift of the Magi. He actually right. wrote that there um, and was doing... But he, O. Henry was not his real name. His real name was William Sidney Porter. Well, wait a minute. So how did he come up with William? Well, the story, and I'll tell you this in a nutshell. He is uh, working in a bank. His wife gets ill and he needs money and he starts embezzling money from the bank. He gets arrested and put in jail. White collar jail. And uh, while he's there, he has nothing to do but write short stories. And one of the stories comes out that um, he doesn't want people to know who he is because they, these stories are becoming very popular. So he says, wait a minute, I'm a, I'm, I have to give myself a pen name. What shall I call myself? He says, where did you, where were you? He was in the Ohio Penitentiary. And he took the O from Ohio, the N, the H, from the H and the E and the N, and he called himself O. Henry and the Y. And that comes from o, o, o. Henry from the Ohio Penitentiary. Now, here's one of the most famous restaurants in New York. This is in Central Park. It's called Tavern on the Green. You can see how elegant it is. Back rack crystal chandeliers. I mean, very, very elegant. But this wasn't always a restaurant, okay? Um, it borders an area called Sheep Meadow. And before it was a restaurant, what was it? It actually was the barn for the sheep. <laughs> and that's what it was. So if you ever come to New York and you eat in Tavern on the Green, you're eating in a sheep's barn, just so you remember. Okay, now many foods have been really created by accident. Probably one of the most famous is a man named George Crum, who was a chef at a restaurant in Saratoga, New York. And he liked to serve sliced potatoes to his guests. And one of them kept insisting that he didn't cut them thin enough. So he kept making them thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. And what was the result? Eventually, they weren't potatoes as we know them. They became potato chips. <clears throat> Another thing invented by accident <clears throat> was at the St. Louis Fair. A man was serving ice cream in a cup, and the ice cream kept dripping all over the place, so he, need, he wanted something else to put the ice cream in. So the man next to him was making waffles, so the man agreed to give him a waffle. They rolled it up. Hence, you have your ice cream cone. Okay. Some other things were, we mentioned chocolate chip cookies before. The woman actually ran out of cocoa to make her cookies. So she actually started using chocolate morsels. Um, beer was invented by accident about 10,000 years ago. And one of the really interesting things is, look at the middle. Cornflakes. It was developed by Dr. Kellogg, who was a psychiatrist. Kellogg. And what it is, is the idea is some of his patients had sexual urges. They were mentally ill. And he felt if he gave them a cereal, which took a lot of time to eat, instead of like oatmeal or porridge, something like that, that they could just swallow, it would stem their sexual urges. So next time you eat cornflakes, just remember that, <laughs> what it was for. The Kellogg, by the way, became very successful, obviously, from Kellogg. <laughs> and this was the brother, by the way, who was a doctor. Right. Okay, let's move on. Here's a place, by the way, we're going to probably show you a short clip. This is uh, one of the great food eating contests that they have every year at Nathan's um, in, Coney in Coney Island. Island. And here is, uh, because it's kind of gross, <laughs> we're only going to show you a little bit of it. And here is... Um, Joey Chestnut. Joey Chestnut, who has won every yeah. year. Now, um, now, if you don't know about the, the contest, not only do they have to eat hot dogs, they have to eat the rolls, too. 
which makes it that much tougher. So we're just going to show you a little quick clip. Not no way! Thing. Just not! That would look like you would eat a lot, right? This is the hour when our nation comes together. Miles Bloom in Florida, Ann Holt in Georgia, Stephen Sladkiss right here in New York. From many, we are one, we are America. This is Nathan's and it is the 4th of July. Count it down with me from five, four, three, two, one, go! And we are, and we are underway. The 2020 men's division of the Nathan's Famous Hot Dog Eating Contest. It's been it's been something else to get this off the ground, and I hope that uh, MLE has been able to help our peers across the sports vertical, MLB, NFL, show them the way that you can have live sports here, and we all got to figure it out. Life inside the bubble going well already. Again, a world Look record on the women's side. So so this is important early. You get the idea. He wound up eating for the world record 76 hot dogs. That was two years ago. Last year. I think he only ate 69. He still won, but 76 was his record. But his wife is the female hot dog eating champion. Her name is Mickey Sudo. Now look at her. Does she look like she's a world champion food eater? Not just hot dogs. These guys compete eating all kinds of things. She ate 48 and a half hot dogs. Ladies, can you imagine doing that in 12 minutes? with the buns, think about it. And there's all kinds of questions, we're gonna look it up. How do they do this? How do they prepare? And you can find it out online, it's very interesting. Contrary to popular belief, most of them do not throw up at the end, which is surprising. Anyway, so we're quickly gonna go, we thought this was cute, go through some foods that some of our presidents considered their favorites. Here's one of our favorite presidents, George Washington. By the way, he was, he was tall. He was six foot two and a half. And he liked hot cakes. Yeah, it was one thing. He liked anything soft because he only really wound up with one tooth in his mouth. He had dentures. So anything that was soft was really a preference for him. President number two, by the way, who was quite pudgy. He was, by the way, described as the great rotundity. Yeah. <laughs> and he liked hard cider. He was from Massachusetts, of Thomas course. Thomas Jefferson, we he, talked about before. Macaroni and macaroni cheese. Macaroni and cheese is one of our favorites. And his good friend, James Madison, loved the ice cream he brought back with him. That became his famous. Uh, James Monroe, being from the South, loved spoon bread. Now, John Quincy Adams, unlike his father, loved to eat fresh fruits, vegetables, things like that. He was in much better physical shape. Uh, Andrew Jackson ate leather britches, which wasn't leather and it wasn't britches. It was actually green beans cooked very hard with crispy bacon. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt loved hot dogs. In fact, he served them to King George and Queen Elizabeth um, when they came to New York for a visit and to the United States. The people were appalled that he didn't have this lavish meal for them. Uh, Richard Nixon loved cottage cheese. I don't, I don't know what that says about his personality. President Reagan is known for eating his fudge brownies, and he always had jelly beans on his desk. Now, George H.W. Bush hated broccoli, and it's true. He never had broccoli while he was in the White House. Um, our last president, Mr. Trump, loves all kinds of fast food. I think that's pretty common knowledge with everybody. Now, there have been some very famous gluttons who've eaten huge amounts of food. Uh, the most famous was a man named Diamond Jim Brady. He was known for eccentricities in jewelry and also what he ate in a meal. I mean, it was absolutely unbelievable. Look at that. Oysters, crabs, turtle soup, seven lobsters. This is a meal. This is one meal. One meal. Sirloin steak, carapin, duck, all kinds French, of things. French pastries. But the thing is, he never drank alcohol, which we found out was interesting. He drank a lot of lemonade. Now, one of the guys that is also famous, and this guy on the left-hand side, you might remember him as Orson Welles, who wrote um, 
He was quite a director, and he was in Citizen, Citizen Kane. Kane. Of course, he played Charles Foster Kane. By the way, um, he used to come to this pub over here and um, drink his beer with his friends, who are writers and, and acting and actors. Um, and he would go to this place called Chumley's, and that was 86 Bedford Street. And the term 86 it was developed in there. But here's Orson Welles, by the way. As a young man. To show you how he drank all this beer. Here he is drinking. By the way, he stiffed this um, restaurant over $200 when a beer was a nickel a beer. Yeah, and look at what his doctor said about his eating habits. My doctor told me to stop having intimate dinners for four unless there were at least three other people. That's how much food he ate. And you can see what he looked like later okay. on in his there life. There was a time, by the way, when beer became prohibitive. This is a prohibition. This is 1918 uh, at the time, and it stayed in effect till 1930. Most people didn't believe in it, but by the way, they were prohibition agents. Remember Elliot Ness and the Untouchables? Well, they were prohibition agents. Do you want to see the most successful prohibition agents of all time? You might remember Kevin Costner. Okay, <laughs> look at these guys. These are Izzy and Mo. They were also all, all overweight and short, and they were prohibition agents. They were so successful. They arrested thousands of people on bootlegging. They were so successful, they got fired. Right. And look how they dressed up. They would knock on doors. People would look at them and say, who are you? They say, we're prohibition agents. People would look at these two overweight guys and start to laugh and let them in, and they'd all get busted. Right. Okay. Now, there were more famous scenes um, in the movies involving food. Uh, this one is Young Frankenstein. After a hearty meal, relax with good company. Some of you might remember this. A classic that we remember growing up was Animal House with the famous food fights. Uh, now, here are some restaurants in New York that have been made famous in TVs and movies. Um, 27 Dresses was made at the other restaurant that they have in Central Park called The Boathouse. Uh, the series on TV, Mad Men, was filmed at the Oyster Bar. This is in Grand Central Terminal. Um, here you have a place called Smith & Walensky, which is one of the oldest steakhouses in New York. They filmed the movie American Psycho there. Uh, Woody Allen's Manhattan was filmed at also one of the famous pizzerias in New York called John's Pizza. Then you have something called the 21 Club. Uh, the movie with Michael Douglas called Wall Street was filmed there. And you used to be able to go down into the vault of the 21 Club and actually have a private dinner there. That was nice. Uh, serendipity, if you want to have great desserts, including something topped with real gold, you can go there. And that's from the movie, of course, Serendipity. Uh, another famous restaurant in New York is called Sardi's. Sardi's is in the theater district. And it was the place where after um, a show opened on Broadway that all the actors and actresses would go to Sardi's and wait for the reviews. And Mr. Sardi was very generous. He would feed actors and actresses without charging them. And if you go there today, this is a place where they have all the great caricatures of the people who are in theater and they're rotated so if people are currently on broadway they'll have their pictures downstairs and they have like four floors of pictures that you can see now another famous place in new york that was closed for a while but reopened is called the russian tea room it's right next to carnegie hall um, now if you're interested in high tea in new york city there are two famous places. You can go to the Palm Court at the Plaza or the Pierre Hotel. It costs about $80 to have tea and some of the little pastries you're having. Um, high tea is usually 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, if you're into ghosts and stuff, there are haunted restaurants in New York City. Right. Here is a haunted restaurant in New York City called Il Buco. Right. And this is a fine restaurant. And they say that Edgar Allan Poe haunts the restaurant. Another one, by the way, one of our favorites is One of My Land and Two of My Sea. And this is the this was owned by Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr is the man who shot Alexander Hamilton. It's considered the most romantic restaurant in New York City. We've eaten it many times. It's terrific. And here, by the way, this is Aaron Burr's daughter. 
Her name is Theodosia Burr Alston. She marries Mr. Alston and she becomes Mrs. Alston. And by the way, Theta Barra, the woman on the lower corner over here, her real name, this is Theta Barra. The so great silent, silent movie actress. actress. <laughs> right. Her real name was Theodosia Burr Goodman. Right. Okay. Here's another restaurant, by the way, uptown. This is White Horse Tavern. Also this is where the man over here on your left hand side. Is Dylan Thomas. And he was a writer and he was in a he had a bet with someone that he can drink twenty seven whiskeys. Whiskies. And he and they drank that many. <laughs> And they rushed him to the hospital, and he wound up dying from that. Yeah, so he haunts the White Horse Tavern. Now, one of the oldest pubs in New York is called the Bridge Cafe, right near the Brooklyn Bridge. And people have seen images of ghosts. No particular one, but images of ghosts that are there. Uh, you also have a place called the Algonquin Hotel. A group of literary greats used to meet there uh, called the Round Table. Uh, you can see some of the names, Dorothy Parker, Robert Benchley, and they would meet there. And occasionally, people said they go in there and they see some of these people sitting at the bar at the Algonquin. Now, another interesting dining experience, if you want to try, you can go to a place called Abigail's Kitchen, where you actually eat your meal blindfolded. And the whole idea is that sometimes when you see something, you don't want to eat it. However, they believe that you should be blindfolded and let your nose smell the food and your taste buds taste the food. They don't give you anything bizarre. Don't worry about it. Uh, but it helps your senses experience better. Now, some other goodies that you can visit related to food. Um, there's a museum of ice cream in New York City. It's one of the newest. It's in an area called Soho. It's kind of pricey. But it's a fun place to go with kids. They have a lot of kids' birthday parties that they sponsor here. Now, something that is near and dear to our hearts, a lot of you know Carvel ice cream. Well, Carvel was actually started about five blocks from where we live in a place called Hartsdale, New York. Tom Carvel used to deliver his ice cream on a truck. And one time his truck broke down. And he started selling his ice cream out of his truck before it melted. And it was so successful that he built the first Carvel stand uh, right there. Uh, and, of course, now it's become a worldwide phenomenon to have Carvel ice cream. Uh, if you don't like ice cream for dessert, <clears throat> there's a very cool place called Rice to Riches. All they make is rice pudding. All kinds of varieties. It's in... Um, an area called Nolita right near Lombardi. You can go to Lombardi's for good pizza and go a block away and have dessert at Rice for Riches. It's really excellent. Uh, now, New York, of course, is known for its cheesecake. And one of our favorites is Junior's. has some of the best cheesecake in the country. Uh, by the way, they ship all over the world, so you can get it up where you are. Uh, a lot of famous drinks were developed here. The Manhattan, the Rob Roy, uh, Bloody Mary, Daiquiri, they were all invented in New York City restaurants. Or if they came from somewhere else in Europe, they were first served in a restaurant in New York City. Now, as we come to the conclusion of our presentation, here's a couple of things that are gone. These are restaurants and food places that are gone but not forgotten. You might remember the Automat, Horn and Hoditz. Where you put your nickels in the machines and you you pull them out and that was something you had also a restaurant called Medix, uh which is uh juice and it's below this is my macy's department it was <laughs> right. right right famous for the orange julius um a lot of our great delis in new york unfortunately closed down uh this is the famous stage deli where sandwiches and things were named after famous performers at the time uh you can see some of them listed there. Uh, then you have the Carnegie Deli. I'd like to get your mouth around that sandwich. It's interesting. The Carnegie Deli actually closed down, but it just reopened about three or four months ago um, in New York City. We haven't tried it yet, but we're going to go in and see if it's as good as the original. Glutton sandwiches. Right. 
Now, when people used to go out for Chinese food in New York and they didn't want to go to Chinatown, which kind of was a little seedy sometimes and sketchy, there were two very famous Chinese restaurants uptown in kind of midtown. One was called the House of Chan and one was called Ruby Foo's. Uh, they were much more elegant Chinese restaurants, no longer exist. Also, another famous restaurant was called Louis Sherry's, which was in the 40s in New York City. Um, Louis Sherry, the company still exists and they make ice cream, but there was a famous restaurant there and they once hosted a dinner party, which was very interesting. You, it was called Dinner on Horseback. They emptied the restaurant out and people actually came on horses into the restaurant and they were served dinner on silver trays while sitting on their horses. Okay. <laughs> and it was a $50,000 dinner. This was in 1903. To give you an idea. Now, some of you, if you came to New York, might remember a restaurant called Shrass, which also was very big on desserts and kind of like little sandwiches and stuff like that. Uh, the most famous French restaurant in New York that closed several years ago was called Lutece. Sometimes it could take you months to get a reservation if you could get one at all. Uh, the most famous German restaurant in New York was called Luchau's. That was down on 14th Street. If any of you saw the movie Hello, Dolly, um, with Barbara Streisand, she was actually supposed to be in Luchau's in New York. Uh, Another famous restaurant was called Sammy's Romanian, uh, known for many, many interesting dishes. Uh, they would serve you Romanian steak. They would serve vodka in blocks of ice. Uh, you see pickles, everything. Now, they would serve bottles of seltzer and you who chocolate syrup. And the other thing is when they put bread on the table, it wasn't butter, it wasn't olive oil, they would give you jars of chicken fat to put on your bread at the time your cholesterol level would jump up 300 percent. and the last one which you'd like to pay homage to is windows on the world which unfortunately of course was destroyed on 9 11 and hopefully some of our favorites that still exist will survive and we'll be back to normal soon. we hope you enjoyed the presentation uh, again this is one of about 85 different ones we do and uh, we're we're looking forward to working with you guys in the future. We now have over over seventy different um, presentations that we do. This is Susan. Hi. Okay. Okay, Marty, do you have any questions or any comments from the audience? Marty, are you there? <laughs> Marty. Okay. Marty probably went to sleep. You had it when you get something to eat. Okay. We see some of the comments. Thank you very much. We hope. You enjoyed uh, the presentation, and we hope a lot of you come to New York and uh, visit some of these great restaurants and establishments and remember some of the little things we told you. We have stomach okay. pumps in Alka-Seltzer, okay, <laughs> for the people that come on our food tours. We do right. seven different food tours of New York City. Right. Thank you for having us. Um, good night, everybody. Yeah. And, and then, uh, I'm hungry. Yeah. So go eat something. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Take okay, care. Good night, Bye. Everybody.